go. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Carl Goulet, and I am the gallery director here at Five Points. Uh, both current exhibitions will be up through December 3rd. Five Points Gallery is open Tuesdays through Saturday or through Sunday, uh, 1 to 5 p.m., and open by appointment. Uh, tonight's talk uh, will be recorded and available to watch later this weekend on our website, fivepointsarts.org. Uh, throughout the conversation tonight, I will be screen sharing images of the individual works and installation images. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A section located at the bottom of your screens. Um, and joining us tonight on tonight's panel, uh, we welcome Nancy Lazar and John Willis. Uh, Nancy, Nancy's exhibition in the East Gallery, Drink the Wild Air, uh, features energetic painted and drawn mixed media observations of the natural and decorated world. Uh, John Willis is a printmaker, printer for other artists and collector. In this exhibition, John Willis Print Retrospective and Collection, we see these three different aspects of John's involvement with prints. Uh, moderating tonight's talk is Matthew Best. Uh, Matthew is a Hartford, Connecticut based artist. Uh, he received his BFA in painting from the University of Hartford and his MFA in painting from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, Best has been in numerous shows on the local and national levels and teaches at Hartford Art School. I'll hand things over to Matt and we can jump into tonight's talk. Hey everyone, and thanks for joining us. And thanks to John and Nancy. Um, I just saw the show last weekend and I was really excited to talk to both of you about it. Um, Carl already said it, but I will keep an eye on the chat window and the Q and A window. So if anything comes in while anyone's talking, I'll wait to an appropriate point and then kind of jump in with the question or comment. Um, Anyway, like I said, I saw the show last weekend, um, and I thought the two of you made a really interesting pair in your work. Um, I kind of spent a lot of my time kind of figuring out, thinking about where I saw similarities and where I saw great differences. Um, but one thing I read in both of your artist statements and through talking with Carl about the show is that both of you have a background in printmaking. So I thought maybe we would start there. John, your connection's probably a little more obvious, at least with these two shows. Um, but I was hoping both of you would talk about how you started printmaking. Um, Nancy and I, you and I talked a little bit about printmaking before we went live. Your relationship to printmaking, um, in your case, maybe how it relates to other art forms that you use. Um, well, um, I, I started printmaking not, I had done it in college, but I had sort of not um, practiced it or had anything available to, to get into it until I read an article about the Center for Contemporary Printmaking. And at that point, I was working full time. Uh, I, I had a framing business and my kids were needed to go to college. So there was very little time to work at my art, although I continued to draw. So I was able to go down to that new facility where there are very few people and really immerse myself one day a week. And that sort of got me through um, periods where painting was almost impossible to get to. So that's how printmaking came back into my life and that opened doors for me because I always had drawn and uh, it was easy for me to do things like um, uh, soft bound etchings. I don't mean easy, but I mean, it was natural. And uh, I did some watercolor uh, monotype paintings with uh, Lisa Mackey very early on in that early 90s. And that got me a, um, uh, into the Vermont Studio Center with a grant for quite a, for a month. And uh, even though I wasn't able to paint, those paintings on paper, I call them fast painting, uh, were very significant. So. That thank answer you. your question, how I yeah, got into it. And it just continued. I continued to study. I worked with a master printers in Brooklyn, Marina Ancona. I always made my own plates, but, and I 
most recently have worked with Marjorie Van Dyke at, and Deb Editions, and uh, it was just very exhilarating for me. Do you have a preferred form of printmaking? I saw one piece, at least in the show, was engraving. Um, well, again, that was a natural outcome of, um, it was very hard for me to see on copper, but having been immersed in framing, I had all this plastic and I could put one of my images under the clear plastic and uh, take lines off it and engraving, all of my engravings, um, except for, well, the majority are on plastic. Okay. I wasn't thinking about the plastic aspect. That's, I was thinking metal. Okay. <laughs> John, that was in your um, biography for the, sh the, the show, but how about your relationship to printmaking? Because I know originally you were more of a sculptor. Um, yes, I started out, well, I started out like a lot of people in art school. I took painting courses, which I hated. <laughs> I'm sorry, Matt. It's okay. <laughs> uh, because there wasn't any friction and resistance, and you always had to make a decision immediately depending on your stroking and the way you were laying the paint down. And my brain just didn't work that way. So I started out doing sculptures basically by painting pieces of wood and assembling them. And I liked that because there was a lot of process time involved and I didn't have to necessarily make a lot of decisions at any given moment. And then by luck, I fell in love if you, if you read my comment about how, why I put the show together was in 1982, I was leaving Minneapolis where I grew up and moving to the East Coast. And I was at the Chicago Art Pier and I got uh, engaged with the Tamarin Institute, which is a, a place that trains master lithographers. And I signed up, at, these are some images in fact that came from that. Uh, so I signed up as a collector, which meant I got a print each year from Tamron, which was very exciting. And that's kind of, I still made sculptures when I moved to Hartford well into the 80s. And um, at, very much like Nancy, I had taken a couple of courses, but it wasn't that big of a deal for me. And then I started working at the Hartford Art School as a print technician even though I didn't know anything about printmaking, but I was I was a pretty pretty good at organizing things, and then I just started to fall in love with it, and I ended up really mostly making prints now, and I am now doing some paintings, but not with oil bar, not with brushes, um, and the reason that I love printmaking is that again, there's a lot of process involved. And it's, uh, you don't have to immediately make a decision every second like you would in a painting. And so I, I like that meditative quality of just sitting in the studio working on a plate or rolling out the ink. And uh, I do my, a lot of my type work and relief. And so I'm carving or I'm, I'm laying down colors and I'm wiping things back. and. I, I just, I like to be a worker bee and not have to always think about every stroke or everything that I'm putting down. So that's, so really sculpture and my, and my printmaking are very related. Uh, some people have even said, well, your prints just look like two dimensional sculptures, which in a way I, I agree with completely. So I hope that, yeah, that was that was actually my immediate thought looking at your work is to me they look like sculptures. Yeah. I thought that was kind of one thing that I thought that was an interesting duality the two of you have is like John, your work to me is very much sculptural, and Nancy, your work to me is more painterly. And kind it seemed like like your work seems more methodical looking to me, John, like very placed, whereas Nancy, your work seems more lyrical and kind of well, I think that the thing we have in common is they're both about getting a sense of three dimensions on two dimensions. Would that do you think that's I agree. 
And I think his work is uh, the geometry is very much like maybe one of my suggestions of tables are just creating planes in space. Um, and sculptors have come into this space that I'm in and I had a lot of them hanging and they see that it's coming off the wall. They see spatial. The, the piece that you have uh, that's right on the screen now, the suggestion of the table, where does that come from? Because to me, it's kind of, I'm seeing kind of the modernist picture plane where it's kind of tipped upwards in the space. Like the space is kind of tipped and then kind of the, the subject is kind of moving around within the space. But for me, well, it's so these, much, sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, in the, in the later pieces, I'm trying to open up that that platform or whatever it is. But, you know, the table is, I mean, my work is domestic. I'm in a house all the time and that my memory bank is focused more on, I mean, I'm not a world traveler. I'm not out doing landscapes. So, so yes, you're right. It's just trying to make the planes a little more active. But if you looked at earlier work, it would have been more contained. Mm. So are the, the pieces, the round pieces that are done on the raw linen, are those more recent pieces or? Uh, so two round ones are more recent and yeah. uh, and basically it's their drawings on the linen. It's sized with clear gesso. And then I work with the same collage and uh, different colored pencils or different media and um, I mean, it's the same as the other ones, really, but the background is dark. And I, I true periodically, I've always done um, darker pieces, but um, mm -hmm. the vertical tall one with the engraving, that was started a long time ago. And I do tend to come back and rework things. And uh, that does the engraving on that. I have another piece where that engraving was turned horizontally and it became a dying stag. I don't think that one's quite finished, but my very first art form was sewing and fabric mm. as a as a very young person. So I love to get back to that. That's why I thought the two round on the linen were interesting, just because the ground feels like more of an inherent part of the piece than some of the other pieces in it. Like it's very much for me looking at it about the fabric. Mm -hmm. And like the linen is very present in the work and seems really uh. important to the work. Mm. In this one too, especially like the ground is there, but also the linen kind of dominates the piece a bit, I think, mm -hmm. for the piece. No, I was really drawn to the two of them out of, especially in the show. Thank you. Just because spatially, I think it works somewhat differently. Well, they are fairly new. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I was curious just because the, the roundness and the material, but it is interesting to see it in relation to sewing and fabric. Absolutely. I can see that. Very cool. All right, John, your show is a little bit different than other shows I've seen at Five Points in that it's a retrospective um, and you're showing other people's artwork and it's artwork that you own. So how did this all come together? Well, as I was talking to Judy and Kyle and we were planning to do a show, the idea just popped into my, I was just gonna show my own work. And then I thought, well, I really have three different coats that I wear or hats, I guess is the term people use. I'm an artist that makes prints, but I'm an artist that also prints other people. Um, and then I'm an art, I collect prints. And those are really different worlds to live in. I mean, as the artist, you decide what to do and you do it, right? But when you're a printer for someone else, you have to kind of remove your aesthetics and your judgments and you're just there trying to help that person make the print that they need to make. The one that's up on the screen right now is by Jules Olitsky. And I worked with, for him about six or eight summers. He would come up for two weeks and I would work with him. And it was totally a different way than I would ever think about making a piece of art. 
because he definitely took brushes and paint thinner and moved all this stuff around. And I had to just kind of figure out, and some of it was very thick. And I'm like, how are we gonna print this? And then I, with the help of Maurice Sanchez, who was there the first year that we did this, we found that we, we could raise and lower the bed. So we would print the paper maybe five or six times, just raising the bed up slightly taking up a layer of ink each time. But, you know, and so that's how he was, but then other artists were very precise, wanted to have everything worked out before we ever started. And so like uh, Tanya, uh, yeah, this one, uh, it's one of those that it's pretty well worked out before we ever started. And then it was just a matter of picking colors and, However, we did do a, a rainbow roll on it where it's darker from the top, then it gets lighter, and then it comes back to an orange at the bottom. That was a decision that was made during the process of making the print. So it's just really interesting to print other people's uh, ideas, you know, because it brings a whole new vocabulary that you might not, I wouldn't even think about. This one is a combination. This is by Tanya Softic, who is, there's a digital component to this, and then there's the hand worked uh, part of it that was done during the process of making each copy. So it was really interesting. And then to just buy prints. I love, I love prints. And I can't afford paintings by people, but I can afford to buy prints. So uh, now this is a print that I also printed um, during that. And these were all done to the Hartford Print Workshop, which is an annual event that we bring an artist in and we work with them for about a week um, making prints, uh, very long days sometimes. We might start at nine o'clock in the morning and print till 10 or 11 o'clock at night for five or six days in a row. So it, it would be an intense period of time and we would bring lunch in and you know you just that's what you did you did that and then you went home and slept and then you got up and did the next day so very exciting though at the same time um, and then you have other pieces like the one in the top right that was done by Donald Sultan and that's a piece from uh, Cameron Institute and so what they do is they make an addition each year of prints uh, and you can be a collector and you give them so much money each year, but they don't tell you what printed it's gonna be. It's a big secret. So you just get this big flat piece of mail in the mail and you open it up and you get to see what you got that year. <laughs> Sometimes you love them and sometimes you think, yeah, I'm not so good. <laughs> I love that one. But this is a piece that I really do like. Uh, so anyway, so so there's these three different ways to think about printmaking, which, and that was the whole idea of the show was to put that together and, and kind of give viewers that sense of what I did and then pieces that, and then in that smaller room, um, the pieces that I either printed with people or I've just acquired through cool. time. So I remember watching Jules Olitsky work on monotypes in the print shop. So when I saw that piece, it was kind of nostalgic. Yeah, <laughs> he was a he's a force. He would just <laughs> go at it. You know, it was pretty amazing. I just remember him chewing gum a lot too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he used to he used to smoke, and so I think he chewed gum <laughs> to, to quit that habit. So, uh, cool. but these are some prints that I worked on and prints that I collected in the smaller space. Cool. And I just uh, I have probably about sixty prints in this category, but I only selected about 12 to 14 that I put up to just, and I wanted a big variation of work. I didn't want it to all look 
there's enough John Lewis out there that I, I want some other work that people are looking hmm. at too, so. Cool, thank you. So. Um, Nancy, there's two statements in your write-up that I kind of wanted to get your take on. One was comparing your light, your work to drawing with light that I think a critic said about your work. And then I think your own description, but I may be wrong. Your work is organized chaos. No, those are both about, from oh, critics articles. What about those? Do they, re they obviously they resonate with you because you included them in your own write up. Um, where do you think they're accurate or where do you not think they're accurate? Are they act like apt descriptions of your work? Well, I think that um, if you're lucky enough to get a review, it starts you thinking. So obviously I have thought about that. And I think maybe in I trace monotypes, and I just want to go back and say I am um, my experience with printmaking is very basic, not complicated. In other words, very direct, simple things that are sort of done on the spot, not pondered over, or they may be layered over. I have the greatest respect for our master printers, but I also found that um, printmaking was a very sharing medium. You share press with people. There's very a great generosity in working with other people in the same facility. But as far as working with light or organized chaos, I think those are accurate in terms of uh, my work. That if I didn't really like them, I wouldn't have used them. But the show also. Um, stimulated a poet friend, Nancy Miller, to write a, an essay on the work. I mean, I've been very lucky about people responding with words to what I do. I don't know if that what answered is, you. What does drawing with light mean to you? How would you, how do you interpret it in relation to your work? Well, drawing with light, especially like in trace monotype, you're removing. So you get these lighter and darker areas, but, uh, Drawing with light means, in other words, we talk about light and painting, and these are drawings, and they, uh, there isn't a great sense of, of light, but there is an airiness and a lightness to them. Um, what is it, how does it appeal to you? Do you think it's not accurate? No, I thought it was interesting. I interpreted it a few different ways, in the literal sense of light and dark, but also in the lightness of the mark. Like the mark yeah. making is so important, yes. and there is a lightness to it. So I thought it kind of was interesting, and in that it seemed mm -hmm. to work on multiple levels. Mm -hmm. I was just curious which of the two you kind of resonated with more. Well, the funny thing is, um, I found a review written by Virginia Mann in 1980, an art critic, and she said, calls it fast life, um, and she uses similar terms about movement and interpenetration and stuff. So the work has been very consistent over time. And drawing is the basis of all the other work I do. This painting, um, the painting center had a call for art relating to dawn and dusk. And uh, I so I attempted to try to do something about dawn and dusk and uh, didn't finish it in time. But um, uh, there were, the second one was dusk and I did happen to have a dark canvas, which is closer, you know, closer to working on the linen. And so that was an interesting challenge for me as opposed to the white paper that I usually work on. And um, I didn't know I was gonna write, do something that had to do with uh, the Ukraine, but uh, I think that's one reason that you do pursue the arts is it allows you to sort of um, figure out what your thoughts are in many levels, you know, whether it's about what's reality and what is, what is energy and what connects us or what's going on in the world. So that was the only political painting I've ever done. <laughs> mm -hmm. Interesting. John, I wanted to circle back to something you talked about in printing other people's work, and it got me wondering how has printed how has printing other people's work changed your work, or has it? Maybe it hasn't. But well, I don't think as far as imagery, it's had a big effect. But I I've, I've learned a lot of techniques because I would have to figure out how to do something for someone, and that might be something that I would have never come across. Uh, this person is Jenny Robinson, who's an amazing artist. We made six of these 
images. There are six in the series, and these are all monotypes. And they have about 12 different layers on each one of them. This is one of those that we, we burned in midnight oil to get, and we made six copies of each one. But out of working with her, I got, a, of course I had a certain affinity with her because her subject matter is not that far away from mine. We're both interested in industrial spaces and construction and things like that. But she just taught me to uh, think about uh, the color and the way to put it together a little bit, but mostly what I learned is from techniques that I have to come up to solve the issue that somebody wants to do on their print. Um, not so much imagery. I haven't really printed anybody directly that I'd like, oh, okay, I think I'm going to do that on my print. You know, um, that has not been the case. It's been more of a technical side that I that I find interest in when I'm printing someone because I really become a worker instead of the artist. I'm not mm. I'm just a, a worker helping someone try to get something to happen. So interesting. All right. So some questions that are kind of for both of you so you can negotiate. Yeah. Um, and one thread I saw with both of your work is your to my eye, you're both kind of skirting this line between abstraction and representation. Um, do you, either of you see your work in that way? Do you see it more as abstraction or is there still more representational or that difference it's doesn't definitely really a, matter? Definitely a blend of the two. I think that that's what a lot of art is right now. Mm. I. Uh... My work comes off if you just kind of look at it as being very abstract, but there's a lot of reference to looking at the way that humans build things and how we put things together and then how there's illusions sometimes. I don't know if you've ever walked down a street and thought, saw a shot of light coming from somewhere and you couldn't quite figure out how all that happened. And so that's what, so I look a lot when I'm walking around or I'm, I love like cities and, and uh, construction sites, things like that. So I, I look at that stuff, but then I translate it into my own vocabulary um, as I work. I, I could add to that. I'm never just working, scribbling or totally working out of my head. I'm always looking at, um, I have a lot of skulls. I have a lot of um, objects that I'll, I, I read once about, I think it was Jasper Jones said something about a rotating point of view. So I might look at something and take lines off this object, maybe go to something else, but it becomes something beyond what I'm looking at. So I am working from life quite the majority of the time. And then other times I might have to want to clarify something and then I'll go find a picture or something that's more uh, specific about a specific area or image and uh, and to you know better inform my line. While I have you, so to speak, um, how do you choose your materials? Is that a more intuitive process or is it something you plan out, like collage elements in particular, or if you're going to well, draw on a piece or paint on it? In my case, um, it's all about recycling because I, I set myself a limit. The a lot of the collages torn up bad old prints. Even the back oh. of a trace monotype is interesting. So actually, I, I forgot to mention this earlier. All of the, not all, but a majority of the collages prints that I made that weren't successful. Um, and if it's on uh, rice paper, kitakata, I use a lot. Um, it's much easier to adhere. I struggled early on with papers that were too thick, but, um, and that does come back in the big round ones, but uh, my materials were basically pencil and paper, which is very democratic. I always told myself, if you want to be an artist, you might not have this or that, but you can always find a pencil and a piece of paper. Very so true. at periods of my life, that's really what I had in terms of time or uh, 
expense. No, that's very true. <laughs> There's always pencil and paper. Um, another question for both of you. Um, I think you have two very different ways of composing work. And I was th wondering how, basically how you go about composing a work, but in particular, I was interested in how you both activate the center, the very center of your composition. Because I feel like that's something you both do very differently, but there's somehow a relationship there. But like John, your centers are often, for lack of a better term, negative space or kind of these ones on the screen, the black spaces in the center. For this well, one, it's like all center and edges more considered. Yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in the edges, but the interesting part is that I'm also always looking at the center imagery or shape as being both negative and very positive. Like it, and some of them it, it really comes out, and then some of them it goes back because things are laying over it. And so it's a juxtaposition of where is something? Is it moving backwards? Is it moving forward? And that's also ties into my bigger kind of overall theme of humans trying to figure out the way the world is operating for them. So it's is like in this uh, drawing and drafting in red, is that center kind of V-shape in front or behind? And then what's happening on the two sides? So there's always this kind of, I try to get a certain amount of uh, argument or division as to how, where the space is in any given piece. Um, it's kind of a metaphor for life, trying to figure out how gets put together, you know, so. But I also like that idea, that big space in the middle. I don't know if that's like, I'm putting myself in the middle or or just that maybe that's how we operate, that that everything is kind of around you. You're, you're like the, the center of a whole big idea or something. I'm not sure, I haven't figured it all out, but, uh, but the juxtaposition of cent centrality versus edges is a really big part of what I'm thinking about when I'm putting pieces together. Uh, there's a couple of pieces, the last one you had up, Carl, and then this one, and the one right before it, I have my most kind of political work because this was, this is a kind of a, uh, offshoot. I'm working, this was back in the summer of uh, 2020 when we had all the uh, Black Lives Matter issues going on and people being killed and that. And I just got, I just had to focus, like red became a big part of my life during that summer. I just, and I was from Minneapolis so when, when uh, all that was going on, it, it really angered me and got me to think about having to think about some other things besides some of the other stuff that I was doing. So in this one, the, the two on the center in the middle and then the drafting in red are both. And then the one right next to drafting in red is also, it's about redlining, how, how we divide cities and territories up and I lived in this wonderful thing called Minneapolis and Minnesota, but we did the same thing. We we segregated the black community from the white community so that we wouldn't be uh, in danger. And so that's how this came about. But that's probably my most political statement or kind of direct statement with those four pieces. So. Thank you. Nancy, what in your work when you're going about creating a piece, what's what do you think about in terms of the center of the work versus the edges of the work and the relationship between the two? Well, um, one of the round pieces, the other one is called a delicate balance. So although I have a central image, um, I'm always trying to like throw it off a little and then bring it back into balance by creating different levels of space. So 
it's clear that the image is central, but um, I have scenes that are shooting off toward the edges and taking leaps. One of the pieces is called Leap of Faith, just trying to um, make it very active, at the same time trying to disrupt but maintain balance. Do, I, does that answer your question a little bit? It's not as, uh, it's definitely yeah. more central. Looking at the two shows, I was feel like, as John said, he's kind of interested in edges, whereas I felt your work kind of more radiated from the center outward. Definitely, yeah. But I was okay because I wasn't sure if that was re a react like part of your working process, or do you kind of start in the center and work outward, or not no? Really? I just start. I just start making marks, and uh, you know, I will try to disrupt that centrality by going over to the left or over to the right, but it always seems to end up as a, you know, a, a table still off, still life kind of setup. Mm. And then the round ones I thought were interesting because there's a real, a kind of vertical axis to the two of them that's or actually the longer one too, but maybe well, there's a the whole, other one, but. There is another series of vertical pedestal pieces where it's a little more narrow. So you have more and this one would be the same. The edges are dressed a little bit more because the space is narrower and vert more vertical. Mm -hmm. um, so related question, I think something else that struck to both of me is weight in both of your work. There's a very different sense of weight and density. And also, I would say tension, maybe tension is more John's work, but um, do you think about weight when it comes, Nancy, when you're making your work? Uh, I very definitely. You know, when I first moved to Washington, this area, we I started a figure drawing workshop at the Washington Art, and I met a lot of other artist drawers. And um, some of them were living on the Calder estate, and we drew in some of the outbuildings on Calder's property. Oh. And so that sense of the mobile of things yes. in okay. space. And um, that I, it's always stayed with me. These one of the advantages of aging is <laughs> you can back, go back and see patterns and see where you sort of picked up this. So it was a very natural thing to try to think about things on a flat surface, not a you know not in space like Calder. But how could you try to get that sense of of movement and space on a two dimensional surface and uh, I think that sense of having experienced that uh, nearness or closeness to Calder, who is so much a part of our Connecticut history, uh, made a big impression on me. Yeah, now that you say that, I see it very clearly. It's a really interesting. It's like, yes, that's. I'd love to show with a, a mobile artist, you know. Yeah, that would be really interesting. John, what about weight in your work? Because that's where I kind of see parallels with sculpture, but maybe I'm wrong. Oh, no, I, I think that this comes out completely on my brain of being a sculptor. In fact, I really look like at my prints, it's just really flat sculptures. I mean, I'm still kind of building something and uh, I'm interested if you read my other statements about uh, concrete forms for building things, bridges, barns, things like that. So the sense of weight and and trying to have this mass of importance, but then these edges that are kind of twisting things around a bit and causing one to think about, so how could that line be over that if this is such a big thing? Uh, Again, I just like that mass and that center. Um, a good friend of mine once said, to, you seem to have a really dark idea about life. And I, I don't think that that's true, but I do like that central mass kind of being the, the issue that everything has to revolve around and, and, and hold its own against that big mass. And that's one of the things I'm always trying to do is like, all right, this is purple, but it's not the only thing that's going on here. So does that make sense? 
I was muted. They're very powerful. Uh, sometimes I, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, They're no, very powerful. Yeah. And sometimes it feels like a, like a Richard Serra. You just want to know where you can kind of walk in behind exactly. that dark form. Yeah. Well, he's one of my favorites. Yeah, <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. The word that came to mind for me looking at your work was tense. Do you think of tense? Because like a, like this one, if you took that white line at the right, oh, I feel like the entire composition would kind of collapse around us, which is also kind of Richard Serra. His work is always slightly oh, dangerous to me. Um, that, that's a really good compliment. Thank you. <laughs> that's exactly what I'm trying to do is to just hold this tension between this big mass and that's also when, like I print, and this is not common in monotype, but I work on a press that has absolute precision as when it comes to putting the paper and the plates in. So that black is probably six layers of black. So it starts out like a blue, and then there might even be a green, and then there's another blue, and then there's a gray, and then there's another gray. So there's this richness too that it feels like an object or a thing that's, that you could kind of take off the wall and it would weigh a lot is, is, is what I'm after at least. So, yeah, very much comes across. So yeah, I, I appreciate that if, if I had taken that line out, it wouldn't work because that's exactly why it does work for me, so. That was kind of the central thing that I enjoyed between your two shows is your work seemed dense and heavy and tense. And Nancy, your work was, lighter and more had more movement and was more free in a sense right. so i thought it was really interesting to see them with each other because i thought they played off of each other really nicely yeah yeah i think that's true i do too it was a pleasure to show with i have great respect for master printers and especially those who are fine artists it's very very special all right, the final question before, and then we can open it up to if the audience has questions. It's my favorite final question. Um, how do you know when your work is finished? It also makes an appropriate <laughs> final question, but it's, I think a lot of artists struggle with this. And when I ask it, people kind of get nervous, but I'm always curious how other artists deal with this. So I'll throw it out there. I just heard Jerry Salt speaking and he raised this issue too. Um, and you know, like it's really hard. I actually do go back. I I have to finally say done, but then I go back maybe a year later and I see just the little thing that I wish I'd done, but I finally do. Like finishing is the hardest part. I uh, this is not a direct answer, but I think it it's the answer that I use is Eva Hess said one time that when you get to a point that you don't know what to do, you should just make another one. Because if you alter that one, you lose the one that was there. So I, I like basically that. work on a piece, and if I don't know what to do with it, I just put it away. And then I do one that maybe relates to that piece, but not I don't copy that piece, but I relate to it. And I work with the issues that were still in my brain that maybe I hadn't resolved. And sometimes I just look at a piece and say, that's a damn good piece. I'm just going to leave that wrong. So, but no, I like even... the house saying, just do another one. Don't, don't try to fix this one because then you lose that one too, so. Yeah, I like that too. It's really apt. Yes. yes. All right. Thank you. Um, now, I guess if anyone has any questions, they can go into the chat window or the Q and A window. Or not. I guess we covered it all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. The awkward silence. Uh, all right. Last call, everybody. <laughs>
Nancy, do you have any questions for John or John, do you have any questions for Nancy? Oh, well, we do have another thing in common. I have five siblings out in Minneapolis, so I know a lot about what's going on out there. And uh, do you go back and forth? Uh, I used to, but all my family has either moved out or passed away. And so huh. I haven't been there for a long time, but it's, it's a beautiful area. It is. If it didn't have so much winter, I'd probably still be there, but <laughs> you know, it's just too cold. But, uh, I, I enjoyed uh, having these two shows together, though. And I do want to say something, and I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I just want to tell anybody that's watching this that we are really lucky to have Judy McAhoon and Carl and Five Points Gallery. I think that if you travel around the country, which I have at Points, there aren't galleries that look any better than this gallery. It's a very professional gallery and it's well run and we are blessed to have this gallery. Thank you, John. I couldn't say it any better. It's a, she says, I do not want art for a few any more than an education for a few or freedom for a few. And it, it's just amazing and mind boggling what they have created. Absolutely. Yeah, completely agree. But I can't say it better than you two at this point, so I won't try. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Carl and Judy, yeah. and both of you. It was wonderful. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Great. All right. The last call for questions. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, John. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good night. And Matt, we'll have coffee sometimes. Okay. Yeah, email me. Bye, everyone. Bye.